Howdy everybody, this is Mr. Miller back again, uh, and this is a video for a momentous day. It is June 1st, Monday, June 1st. Uh, I cannot believe that we are already in June. It feels like it was just yesterday that we were in March and we were leaving school. Uh, but at the same time, it feels kind of like an eternity ago that we were in school. Uh, anyways, we are going to continue on today with our second to last day of notes. Uh, Ever, I guess, uh, in terms of U.S. history. So we have um, we have topic 19 and 20 that we're finishing up to today. Uh, we or not today, tomorrow. We're finishing up today and tomorrow. Uh, then Wednesday and Thursday are going to be uh, the crossword for 19 and 20. And then Friday's a catch-up day. And then on Monday of next week, I will be sending out an email. Or I'll be sending out an email later today about uh, the details for next week. So it'll be a little bit more relaxed, and I'll have those details out uh, out for you at some point on Monday today. So uh, that is the deal. Without further ado, let's jump into our topic, 19 and 20 notes. We're going to get through 13 through 15 today, 13 through 15. So uh, number 13 here uh, with... Uh, topic 19 and 20. We just wrapped up uh, the conversation about uh, the 9-11, September 11th terrorist attacks and the war on terror. We had talked about that on Thursday. Today we're talking about uh, an issue that pops up later on in George W. Bush's term in office uh, that then leads us in, into a period of economic issues. So we have the financial crisis of 2008. So George W. Bush wins re-election in 2004. He's president for eight years. Uh, he is up as president in the end of 2008, beginning of 2009 is finally when he's out. Uh, but in that time period, 2007, 2008, there is a crisis that, that blows up. Uh, kind of in everybody's faces, I guess. Uh, and it's a financial crisis. It is a, uh, an economic issue. So the problem here, okay, what ends up happening? Uh, I guess the main root cause of this financial crisis was uh, house lo housing loans. Okay, when I go to buy a house, I go to the bank and I say, hey bank, can I have some money to buy a house? Because I don't just carry around $200,000 or however much that is. Uh, usually, very few people actually pay outright for houses. Most of the time they go to the bank, they get what we call a mortgage, uh, and those mortgages are basically a loan that says, I will repay the bank uh, this money eventually uh, over 20 years, 30 years, however long the mortgage lasts for. So uh, the bank technically owns the house until you can pay that back. Uh, the person selling the house, they get their money right away. Uh, they get their money from the bank right away. And the person who's buying the house then pays off the bank. So all that stuff understood now. Um, if you wanted to look into housing mortgages a little bit more, you could. But uh, what happens here is in the late 2000s, banks are starting to give out loans to people who, I don't want to say they don't deserve them, but they are people who don't really, they're not good loans, okay? And by that I mean, uh, when I go and I purchase a house, okay? When I go and I purchase a house, let's say that I make somewhere around fifty to sixty thousand dollars somewhere in that range okay um, let's say I make that now also let's say that I go to the bank and I say I want to buy a million dollar house on skinny Atlas Lake okay million dollars for the house and I'm gonna take out a loan for ten years okay I'm gonna take out a ten-year mortgage now the bank would say hmm wait a second he's only making from fifty to sixty thousand dollars in a year and he is taking out a loan for a million dollars and he's gonna pay it back in ten years how is he ever gonna do that that's a horrible loan uh, and then the bank would say nope we do not accept your loan we're not gonna give you that loan for that house so I would not be able to buy that house it makes sense because I have no business in buying that house I have no way that I'm gonna be able to pay that back so with that in mind um, banks at this point were giving out some risky loans. They weren't giving out the loan that I was saying, like, okay, a million dollars and I'll pay it back in 10 years. Uh, they would say, okay, well, you know, we might be able to give you a loan for part of that money, or we might be able to give you a loan for, um, a loan for a longer period of time. Uh, 
still, I might really have a hard time paying it off, and odds are I'm not going to be able to. But the bank might take the rods and pay or take it. Okay, because the idea was is that if you uh, don't go ahead and uh, pay off your loan, they can go ahead and take your house back. So, okay, the bank isn't out of much there. So banks are handing out these loans to people who really don't deserve them or have no business getting those loans. Again, I say don't deserve them. Everybody deserves to live in a nice house. I'm not saying that you don't deserve a house. I'm saying that, that the income doesn't line up with the house that you're getting. That's, that's what I'm saying. So uh, poorly qualified borrowers get these, get these uh, loans and they give out high rates. And when these people are unable to, unable to pay them off, uh, we get into a problem. Also, another issue is that uh, they call it the housing bubble, meaning that the amount of money that people are charging for houses is going up, up, and up. Okay, you might see that in uh, Moravia, really. Okay, so look in Moravia, in the village of Moravia. Uh, back in uh, the 1970s and 80s, uh, you could buy a house in the village, a uh, decent sized house for $20,000, $30,000, $40,000. Okay, that's the price of a car. Uh, nowadays, people, I mean, the cheapest houses in the village are right about $100,000, and the nicer ones are way higher than that, over $200,000 in some, some cases. So the, the bubble gets bigger and bigger. People are paying more and more for these properties. Uh, and since that was happening, loans were getting bigger and bigger at this time. Uh, so people are paying more, they're taking out bigger loans that they might not be able to pay back, and the banks are letting them do it because they're getting high interest rates on this on these loans. Now all this comes to a uh, all this comes to a head in 2007 when the country goes into a recession. Okay, it happens to de or it happens to uh, mostly happens because uh, the housing market was kind of a little shaky because of all those details that I had just given you. And when those detail or when those things are a little shaky, all of a sudden people are a little bit more hesitant to invest money. They think things are going to go badly eventually. Uh, so they back out of the economy and they don't spend as much money. And then that turns into a recession. Okay. Now what ends up happening is this recession happens and then it has a chain reaction. If I lose my job because of a recession in 2007 and I've just taken out a half million dollar loan on a house that I don't really have any business paying for, I'm not going to be able to pay for it. Now that's going to, and I, and I might have just been able to make my make ends meet with the payments, me losing my job, there's no way I'm paying that off. So what do banks do? They uh, do what we call uh, foreclosures, okay, foreclosures, meaning they say to, uh, they say to the, um, they say to the people living in the house, hey, you got to get out. Okay, we are taking this uh, property over and we are going to resell it to somebody who can pay. Okay, that's a foreclosure. That happens occasionally uh, to people and it's a very sad day when that happens. So foreclosures are happening. People lose their homes. Uh, people losing their homes uh, because there's so many people getting kicked out of their homes. There's so many houses that are hitting the open market and banks are trying to resell them for their value. So what happens? Uh, housing prices drop, okay? So the housing bubble, as they called it, the bubble that was inflating, 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 the, the market for houses, all of a sudden it pops and right back down to nothing. So houses were going pretty cheap, but nobody was buying them because, uh, because nobody was able to afford them. They just got kicked out of their other house. So how are they supposed to afford this house? So housing prices drop. Uh, banks who rely on people going in and taking out loans, uh, these banks end up falling, okay? And these banks close in some cases. Many, many larger banks ended up closing in this, uh, in this financial crisis. Now, there were a number of banks in, uh, in this time period that were seen as being very, very, very important to the American economy. If all of our banks fail in these uh, in these times, uh, if all of our banks fail, then we are going to have a big issue where nobody's money is really safe and there's no stabilizing forces in our economy. So George W. Bush, the president still at this time, uh, has this idea of giving a what he calls a bailout, meaning he is going to give money directly to banks to keep them afloat, keep them up, keep them alive. 
So this bailout is $700 billion, $700 billion with a B, uh, $700 billion given out to banks to keep them alive during this time because those banks would have failed otherwise. And he said, uh, along with a bunch of other financial advisors, I have good as sneeze. <coughs> I did it. Okay. Bless me. Uh, so uh, his financial advisors, and he said that these banks were uh, a phrase. He said they were too big to fail, too big to fail, uh, meaning that these banks are uh, the economy needs them. We can't survive without them. So they are too big to fail. They absolutely need to survive. Uh, they are the only thing keeping our country from an economic meltdown, an economic catastrophe. Okay, so we need these banks to be alive. Now, one side effect of this is that other people, the non-advisors here and a bunch of other people around the country said, hey, where's my bailout? All these big banks who make a bunch of money off of my back, taking my interest money when I'm buying houses, okay, they get the bailout because, oh, we need them to steal more of our money, but what about me? I don't get a bailout. Uh, there's no government money coming straight to me uh, to keep me afloat. And it's just the, the rich people who get more money and the poor people are left on their own to survive. So that's a feeling that a lot of people are having at this point, handing multi-million dollar executives more money just to allow them to take more advantage of people. Uh, so that part is a little fuzzy there and a little tricky. Now, real quick, a couple things about these uh, about these pictures here. Uh, this uh, political cartoon here, you see the housing market and these subprime mortgage loans were these very bad loans that people were taking out where they didn't really have any business paying them back or weren't going to be able to pay them back. And those uh, subprime mortgage loans are a wrecking ball that are coming in to uh, break up the housing market. Um, yeah, all I can think of when I see that is Miley Cyrus with wrecking ball, but it is what it is. Um, now, uh, housing prices versus inflation, okay? Uh, this chart over here shows that inflation, uh, this uh, black, uh, the solid line, the darker line, is pretty much rising. That's inflation, the consumer price index. Uh, but family homes, uh, median family homes, the middle value of family homes, were rising, 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 rising throughout this time. From the mid-90s all the way up until the mid-2000s, and then there were some really big spikes that were happening. Uh, and so things were, were just, just astronomical, and the prices of houses were going up higher than the actual value of money was. So these, uh, these value of house, or the value of houses here were being artificially inflated by the market. So it's kind of interesting, uh, kind of interesting what was going on here. Okay, now let's go ahead and talk about the solutions to this, okay? Uh, number 14, uh, Obama elected in hope is part of the reason why Barack Obama gets elected is because of the financial issues. Now, Barack Obama, okay, I've written his name here. He ends up defeating, uh, so Barack Obama uh, ends up defeating John McCain. Uh, Barack Obama's a Democrat. Uh, John McCain is a Republican. Okay, John or Barack Obama, Democrat, John McCain, Republican. John McCain, a supporter of George W. Bush. Uh, George W. Bush is not super popular at this time in 2008 because he's just kind of led us straight into a recession. Uh, and so he's not really doing the best in terms of his popularity rating. So John McCain has a difficult, uh, difficult pathway here. Now, Barack Obama becomes the first African-American president, as you, I'm hoping, know. Uh, he rides uh, what we would call a wave, a liberal wave, uh, to become president. He kind of takes a lot of different voters from a lot of different places that might not have been traditional liberal voters uh, and kind of pieces them all together. Uh, by that, I mean like trade union people who were traditional voters uh, for the Democrats, uh, but also... Uh, some workers who, who might have been taken advantage of by this, uh, by this economic issue. Uh, also, um, I guess uh, LGBTQ plus groups uh, would have been involved with this. Uh, so Barack Obama is combining a lot of different groups uh, to be able to kind of um, gain support here. Now, like I said, Republicans had very limited chance at actually winning because the economy was so low in uh, George W. Bush's time in office. So that part is uh, important to kind of keep in mind. Uh, George W. Bush did not, uh, did not have the popularity, so that means that Republicans are going to have a hard time here. 
And uh, one thing I should mention, uh, the choice that Barack Obama made for uh, Secretary of State was Hillary Clinton. Hillary Clinton, meaning uh, she actually ran against him in 2008 uh, for the Democratic nominee for president, but lost. Uh, so he makes her uh, his Secretary of State, and she later goes on to run against Donald Trump and uh, lose in 2016. So she runs for president a couple times. <clears throat> Uh, Barack Obama's vice president is Joe Biden, the same guy who is uh, running as the Democratic nominee for president now. So uh, he's been around for a while. Now, let me, I guess I need to go on to number, oh, here's a map. So you can see here, uh, Barack Obama wins a large number of the electoral vote. <coughs> <coughs> this was pretty close in terms of the, uh, in terms of the popular vote, uh, but the electoral vote is kind of a, more of a, more of a one-sided split. Now, number 15, okay, number 15 here. So uh, when, uh, when Barack Obama takes office, uh, he does a couple things specifically to try to, um, to, try to uh, get people back to work, okay? And get people money that they need. Uh, he passes what they call a stimulus package, a stimulus package. Uh, George W. Bush had passed a stimulus package as well uh, that we didn't talk about, but in 2007, 2008, he passed a stimulus package. It was meant to, to as, the, as the phrase means, to stimulate the economy, okay, to pump money into the economy. This is economic pump priming, just like they did back in the Great Depression. Put money back into the economy so then the economy can start going again, just like you do on like a push lawnmower or something like that, if you know what I'm talking about. Uh, so priming. No, um, gives money to uh, state and local governments. Gives uh, gives tax cuts to normal people uh, to allow them to uh, to allow them to save more of their money at this point. Uh, now, one of the things here is that unemployment is kind of shooting up pretty drastically. Now, let's look at the uh, unemployment rate that is before uh, before this whole economic. Uh, catastrophe starts here before this recession breaks out. Uh, the unemployment rate is right about 5%. Okay, right about 5%. Uh, is right over here in December of 07. Shoots up, shoots up. It's about 8% when Barack Obama takes office in January 2009. Goes up even further to about 10%. Uh, most of, most people would probably say that this, this first part is not Barack Obama's fault. Uh, because uh, it was kind of in play earlier. Uh, also, many people might say that this uh, turn in the graph might not be Obama's fault either, or his uh, what he did, uh, because George W. Bush was trying to stop things earlier. Uh, but it takes a little while for economic decisions to play out, uh, for the economic decisions to actually be felt. So unemployment peaks in 2010 or 2009 at about 10%. Uh, there were a large number of people who lost their jobs in this uh, great recession, they call it. Uh, my dad lost his job. He worked at Borg Warner, and he lost his job one day when I was a junior in high school. So uh, it happened to a lot of people. Uh, the economy starts to stabilize by 2010, and there kind of is a slow growth from there. Uh, unemployment stayed very high for a long time. Uh, remember, good unemployment is right about 5%. So it took eight years to get down to about 5%, which is a very long time, okay? It took, took a very long time for the economy to recover from this. So a lot of people would say that uh, while, um, they would say that while, yes, uh, both of these presidents made decisions that were successful in terms of limiting the damage of this uh, of this uh, recession, uh, they would economists would also probably say that neither were really awesomely successful at limiting the economy or the economic impact because it took a very long time for us to crawl out of this uh, recession. So all that stuff being said, it was, they did stuff, but it was marginally successful, I guess I would say. Now, uh, the government also uh, wants to, after this economic issue, uh, they want to keep track of banks a little bit more closely, uh, limit the sorts of loans that they can hand out to people, uh, make sure that the problems that we had at the beginning of this, uh, at the beginning of this economic crisis do not continue and do not happen again. 
Okay, you learn from the mistakes and you get better at them, or you get better at the situation, or you make it so that the situation doesn't occur again. So that is one thing that uh, the economy is, or that the government is trying to do at this point. Sorry, that's yawn number one. Um, but yeah, making sure that loan rates are kept under control so that, the, uh, so that the issues that are present here in this great recession do not happen again. Now, um, Barack Obama also offers a bailout to auto companies uh, like GM and Chrysler, who is responsible for making Chryslers and Dodges and things like that. Uh, Ford, uh, Ford, the other one of the big three automakers in America, didn't take the uh, money from the recession or from the bailout. Uh, GM, I believe, paid it all back. I don't know about Chrysler. But uh, the auto industry took a big hit because one thing that happens is uh, when you have uh, when you have a lot of people who are making a lot of money, they buy cars. And when you have a lot of people who are not making a lot of money anymore, they do not buy cars. So that is an issue that uh, that they were facing at that time. Uh, car sales were just like tanking at that point. So uh, the car companies had to get money from the government, or at least some of the car companies had to get money from the government to survive. Now, this recession, like I said, lags into the late 2000s, or into the mid-2000s, actually. Uh, so we're into uh, December 2016, and just from a point of reference, at that point, Donald Trump had already been elected president. So through Barack Obama's term, he is dealing with this recession and trying to smooth it over and fix it and improve it constantly. So there's slow economic growth throughout the whole time. Now, one thing that I need to mention, uh, a government, uh, not a government, a protest that happens. Uh, it's called the Occupy Movement. Uh, the Occupy Movement, I really should have a picture of this, but I do not. Um, the Occupy Movement was a, um, there was, it all started at Wall Street in New York City, downtown New York City. Uh, Wall Street is seen as the financial center of America and maybe the world too. Uh, so Wall Street is uh, the site of our stock market and all that stuff. So what ends up happening is uh, there's a group of protesters who take over a park down in, down off of Wall Street, uh, right around the corner from the World Trade Center, uh, the ground zero from the World Trade Center because the World Trade Center was uh, taken out earlier than this, uh, but right in that same area. Uh, but the uh, Occupy movement, they are protesting that uh, the mega rich, the super rich in America are just very, very dangerous. And that's their opinion is that they're very, very dangerous. Uh, they say that, uh, and this is true, uh, so this is not, uh, not just interpretation or opinion. They say that 1% of the country, 1% of the population owns 40% of all the money in our country, which is true. 1% uh, of the uh, one percent of the entire population owns about forty percent of the country. Four percent of the money in the country. So that part is maybe a little concerning if you think about it. So uh, they are down there protesting, and these Occupy movements pop up all over the place. And this happens in uh, like two thousand. I want to say two thousand eleven, twelve. Uh, this is this is going on. Um, they popped up in many, many places around the country. I remember I was out in Buffalo at the time and I was driving through Buffalo and there was an Occupy movement downtown Buffalo uh, where they would just camp out. Uh, it was kind of just a shanty town sort of thing uh, that they set up down there. So just an interesting thing, but they're protesting the wages and the wage gap in America. So uh, I think that's all I've got for you today. So I did better on time that time. Not perfect, but I did better on time. So uh, I got two essential questions for you to answer. If you would, please do so. Uh, answer those and submit those. And then uh, tomorrow is our final notes day for the year. So that should be exciting. A somber moment, perhaps, but a, an exciting day nonetheless. Uh, so I will leave off. I will leave off there, and I will uh, set you, or I'll send you off to do your essential questions. And I will uh, be back here again tomorrow to see you uh, for the last notes day. But we'll still have stuff to do uh, later on uh, after tomorrow. So uh, with that being said, uh, farewell, so long, goodbye, adios, see you tomorrow.